I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight to the George Washington University for Big Night, Big Jobs, a conversation with area's top chefs on creative cooking, healthy eating, and the challenge of balancing those values with the desires and expectations of their customers. My name is Diane Knapp, and I chair the GW's Urban Food Task Force, which has organized tonight's panel discussion. We're most fortunate to have four renowned chefs with us. Nora Pognon, Ms. Pognon has crusaded for clean food since the early 1970s when she first became aware of the conventional farm practices and the use of chemical additives, pesticides, and hormones in our foods. Her goal was to show people that healthy foods, clean foods, taste delicious. That goal blossomed into a campaign for organizing organics in a more sustainable lifestyle. In 1979, she opened restaurant Nora, which became the nation's first certified orga organic restaurant. Her vision has been instrumental in shaping organic certification standards for restaurants nationally. She's also combined her interest in cooking with teaching and has established an internship program for organic cooking for women chefs and restaurateurs. Nora broke new ground launching the initial framework for the farm to table movement that we know today and has championed the connection between local farms, growers and producers with the urban population. She also advocates ad, uh, actively for cleaner oceans, for the preservation of food populations and other environmental issues. Todd Gray, also a star chef when he opened uh, Equinox. Todd Gray is a top culinary talent in DC and an avid promoter of local and seasonal foods. As I understand it, he's known to head off in, before sunrise for the Eastern Shore to catch rockfish. <laughs> Todd has earned many awards for his artistry and inspired menu combinations, including Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington's 2008 Award for Best Fine Dining, five nominations for the James Beard Foundation's Best Chef Mid-Atlantic Award, and eight <coughs> nominations for the Restaurant Association's Chef of the Year. Todd's knowledge of French and Italian techniques and proclivity for invention have also made him a popular teacher. He is a leading advocate for the First Lady Michelle Obama's Chef's Move to Schools program and was chosen by Assistant White House Chef Sam Cass to address a meeting of chefs from across the nation at the White House on food, health, and nutrition. Spike Mendelson. At 13, Spike stepped into the kitchen of his parents' busy restaurant to cover for a missing cook, and he's been cooking on high ever since. After studying at the Culinary Institute of America and with French master chef Gerard Boyer, he took center stage as a contestant on Top Chef Chicago on Bravo TV Network. Spike's current focus has been his two-year-old restaurant, Good Stuff Eatery, in Washington, D.C., that features his favorite foods, homemade hamburgers, fries, and milkshakes, in an environmentally friendly atmosphere. It's been praised by the Washington Post as the best burgers 2009 in D.C., has been frequented by the first family. And Jose Andres, internationally recognized as a culinary innovator, Jose is credited with introducing Americans to both avant-garde and traditional Spanish cooking. A native of Spain, Jose is a James Beard award-winning chef and co-owner of Think Food Group, which is responsible for Washington's award-winning dining concepts, Haleo, Zetania, Oyamel, Cafe Atlantico, and Mini Bar, as well as Los Angeles's celebrated destination, The Bazaar, and other innovative restaurants around the country. He's the author of several tech, uh, cookbooks and the host and executive producer of the PBS series Made in Spain. Jose is also known for championing the role of chefs in the national discussion on hunger and food issues. He added educator to his resume this year with lectures at Harvard in their science and cooking course and has been working with us here at GW to further the role of food in education. 
We are also fortunate to have with us tonight moderator, the former Washington Post food editor, award-winning author, and food blogger, Jane Black. Jane has written extensively on food politics, current food trends, and sustainability issues, and is currently working, working on a book about one town in West Virginia's efforts to change its food culture, in follow-up to Jamie Oliver's work last year in Huntington. She continues to write for The Post, as well as The New York Times, The Food and Wine Magazine, and has a regular podcast on edible radio called Smart Food. After the panel discussion tonight, we hope to have enough time at the end for questions from the audience. Um, at the conclusion of the program, I hope that you'll join us uh, for a brief reception on the second floor of the building. So for now, please uh, silence your phones. And thank you very much for being here. And I'll turn the mic over to Jane. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, fair, right? yeah. 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 So they see you. All right. Well, am I on? Yeah. Thank you um, very much for having me. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Um, this is a sold out show. And um, it's no wonder, really, given the panel that we have here tonight. Uh, we are very honored to have everybody here. But I want to make clear that that doesn't mean that we're going to make this easy for them. Um, we plan to ask them some very hard questions about sustainability and chefs and kitchens. Um, and I say we because I have uh, in this list of questions several questions that were submitted by students. Um, and we're also going to have about 15 or 20 minutes at the end where uh, we hope that you will come up to one of the mics and ask questions of the panel directly. Um, the main goal of this evening is to talk about balance and how do chefs balance what we call doing the right thing, uh, both for themselves, their family, their restaurant, um, and for others. And by that, I mean their customers and their suppliers. What are those choices? How can and how do they implement them? Um, right now, a lot of us would think that those right choices include taking into consideration sustainability, humane treatment of animals, um, but also questions of health. Should entrees on menus be low fat? Should they be low salt? Should we make people eat their vegetables? Um, would that even work, <laughs> given what customers really like to eat and the tough reality of running a restaurant? Um, so you know, there are a lot of different choices that chefs have to make, and we're going to be coming to a wide range of them tonight. Um, I want to start with Spike um, with the question of creating a sustainable menu. And um, you have uh, a goal of using excellent, environmentally friendly products, but you're also selling at a much lower price point than chefs in fine dining. So tell us a little bit about how you do that and keep the price right. The price point mm -hmm. low? Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's uh, like you said, it's a matter of balance. I mean, you know, it's, you develop really great relationships with your purveyors. Uh, you go out there, you visit them, you talk to them, and you just try to get the price you know, th that you're purchasing goods at, at the lowest possible you know, price that you can, you can afford. So then you can, af you know, you can have the, the menu items be, you know, you know, my checkpoint average is about $12 a good step eatery, for instance. And that's you know, a lot of hard work of trying to buy product that the price is a lot lower so I can afford to put it on the menu for, that, for the clientele at that price. So you use grass-fed? Beef or I do. Okay, and so that's more expensive. I sure. Mean, I, well, no, I, I mean I use I use corn, you know, corn-fed beef. Okay. And, and grass-fed. Okay. I mean I try I try to do as much as I can. If I were to use 100% grass-fed beef at my restaurant, I'd be broke. I mean I wouldn't be making the money. I mean it's really expensive to facilitate. I don't think there's really any steakhouse. Well, maybe maybe a couple, but I don't think there's that many steakhouse that don't have corn-fed beef on the menu. Okay. I mean, would you agree probably with that? No. Uh, this was a question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was looking for Jose to bail me out a little bit, but it's, it's not happening. I mean, I, I'm no, I'm just, you know, like, for instance, you know, there was a huge, um, you know, uh, discussion uh, with Tom Calicchio and, you know, what kind of beef he was using at his steakhouses. <laughs> and, you know, as chefs, we do try and preach as much and support uh, grass fed beef, but sometimes it's just impossible if you're trying to stay afloat as a business owner. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my motto is, is I try to do as much as I can in the restaurant to support the cause, um, but I also think that going out and into the public and visiting the schools and promoting it and being an ambassador for, for that type of uh, culture, 
um, is also really important and, and is a way of trying to make it happen. Okay, so. I'm going to stop you there because I want to come to that issue later. I want to just sort of move on to Todd, who also has a huge reputation in the city, well, everybody here does, for so sourcing locally and for trying to make those decisions. You have a much higher price point. What's the average check at Equinox? So I really got to tell you in that. No. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, check average per person before tax and gratuity is somewhere in the mid-80s. Okay, so you have some some more flexibility in terms of what kinds of things you can buy, but you're still having to make difficult choices. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? I mean, for you? you know, bringing up the whole grass-fed beef. I mean, um, you know, we find that. Uh, I mean, food cost is everything. I mean, we have to make money. You know, I mean, um, the restaurant business is. I mean, fine dining restaurants with the linen and the cost of labor and the premium wages that you have to pay to have that type of service and the type of cooks that you have to hire, um, your costs are very high. So the margin is always very slim. Although the check average might be high, the, the cost associated with running a restaurant like that is very expensive. So um, sourcing product for us, of course, you know, I had a conversation today, you know, it's about bringing in local beef from my local farmer and we end up, you know, using the ground, and I do hamburger on the lunch menu. It's a nineteen dollar hamburger, but it's nice. Right? But but it's a small farm. It's a small farm product that is well marbled. It's it's aged twenty eight days, and you know, I mean, it's for for ground beef for uh, four dollars a pound, and when you can get ground beef for a dollar ninety, for maybe even less than that, probably um, for more mass produced product. Um, I mean, sometimes you have to make um, you have to make some educated decisions. I mean, but we have to survive. But you want to support a farmer, right? And so, you is there ever a point where you say, "I'd like to support you, but you know, that's just not going to work yeah. for me." And yeah. you have to sort of educate them on. Absolutely, we that. have the conversation all the time. I mean, I have a new farm that I work with in the in the Plains, Virginia, and he's a spectacular guy, and just quick. I mean, you know, a guy that raises all corn-fed beef, and and I love grass beef, and I know I can probably speak, but. It, to me, I don't like grass-fed beef. I mean, I like it, but it doesn't eat. Americans want marbled beef. I mean, you can stand there and preach grass-fed beef. She probably preaches better than I do. <laughs> but in the end of the day, it's not about what... It, it, you have to have that... The, 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 the product has to be something that brings them back again. So I can espouse my views on this animal and all it's ever had was creek water and the only people between the animal and the customer <laughs> has been a butcher and myself and a couple of cooks. But and no corn, but I don't, I don't, I don't do that much. I, I, I like corn-fed beef. And so I've got this new farmer, and, uh, and he's, you know, this is a second career for them, but they're, they're in it to make money. And they're, they're very successful at what they do. They raise the animal, they, you know, they feed them like children. I mean, with bottles, and they're, they're, they're coddled, and they're, they're, they are corn-fed starting at a young age, and they, they're, these, they know what they're doing. I mean, they're from the Midwest. They know how to corn feed animals. Um, but it's expensive. And, and we've talked about today, you know, should we bring more strip loins in? Should we bring more tender loins in? And I said, you know, I think we're having some pricing challenges with, with, our, with our guy. And he says, well, I think that at some point we just need to raise the price of the beef on the menu. I mean, at a certain point, we can't have pricing in the 40s. I mean, I, you can for certain things. You can sell white truffles for... I don't know, hundred dollars a plate, right. but beef. You know, people want to have associate value. You still have to have a value. You have to have some value driven on your menu. Mm -hmm. So, there's no doubt challenges that are involved with it, and you do have to talk to them about it. And we all say, you know, maybe we should do a smaller piece and do a braise next to it. You know, we do the short rib and then we do the strip loin. So you're taking some of the premium cuts, and you're, you know, same with small lamb or small veal. You end up taking <laughs> front quarters and hind quarters and end up making sausages and different preparations so that you can afford to have that specialty brand on the menu. Right, right. So it's not only about the negotiation with the supplier, but exactly what goes on your plate and what goes alongside with it. You know, mm -hmm. throw a couple extra root vegetables on and you're in business. As much as portions are called tapas. <laughs> yeah, we're right, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, sure, exactly. You know, I mean, yeah, exactly. You go to Jose's, you know, Jose's, Jose's check out is 80, it's like this big. Right. This you get $80, $80 for air, you know? I serve a half and he's 40. No, but... But that's why whole animals are important for us right. too, buying whole animals because right. the, the... Well, explain to people how that helps you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
Let's see if I can give a sort of a price. Uh, um, but, a whole animal, okay, so an animal that would be 1,200 pounds on the hoof is, is butchered and then is hung. So a half of an animal turns out to be, once it's all cleaned up and its uh, hang weight would be somewhere aside, which would be half of an animal, would be somewhere 350, 400 pounds. So the animal is 1,200 pounds, the yield's typically 800, you cut it in half, you have two 400 pound sides, and that's bones and ribs and everything. Um, and typically that animal will come in somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 or $1,500, maybe 1,700 for half an animal, $3,500, 3,000 for the whole. You know, I mean, for us, and the small farmer needs his money. You know, it's not somebody say, hey, drop the animal off and we'll send you the check. I mean, they, they you know, they need their money up front. So um, by doing the whole animal, we're able to take the front quarter and stew meat and make stew out of it. Take do you the ever notice the way chefs keep pointing to various parts of their body and right, it's sort right. of freaky right. when they I'm do I'm going to stand up in a second. Yeah, just yeah. right here. Right. But, but it, it, the economy is a scale because if right. we have... the and this is, we always were challenged with the fact that we'd say, well, we'll take half an animal, but the one strip loin and the one rack and the one tenderloin that comes <laughs> off half an animal is gone in a day and a half. Right. And you're sitting on 200 pounds of leg meat and Grub. ground beef. So Not if you don't burger. have a hamburger on your menu, you need to put one on your menu. Yeah. Right, yeah. Over my side. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, we, we, we tried all that. We tried like, hey, I'll buy the whole animal if you take you, all the ground beef and... Um, the problem is that they can't keep up with the, the right. demand because you'd say, well, I can take strips and racks and tenderloins all day long. It's that ground beef. You have to have a little freezer space to hold the ground beef. But that's the way we make our money, and that's the way you're able to justify doing it. And without uh, the right facility and the right team in place, it, it can be difficult. And you're left with buying those premium cuts at premium pricing, and that, that's challenging for sure. Well, I'm gonna just move on to Nora. Um, it's a slightly different version of the same question, but one of the things I thought is interesting is we talk about price is obviously one thing, but also when you're dealing with a small producer who you want to support, it's not the same as calling up and having the Cisco truck pull up with exactly what you need. And so sometimes you really have to shift your menu because someone doesn't have what they said they were gonna have or they're late or things like that. So can you tell us a little bit about how you have to change things on the fly in order to work with the people you work with? Well, I think it's easier uh, because the whole structure of the restaurant is that I change the menu every day. And every day when I sit down with my chefs and my buyer, uh, we, and the sous chef, we, we, uh, we, he's, he tells us what is, will come in and he will tell us, you know, what the inventory is in the in the walk-in and then we look what we sold the night before, what didn't sell. And uh, so if, uh, since I change my menu every day, if a supplier calls me up and said, you know, I, I don't have the chickens that you asked because they just didn't grow as fast as I thought, so I, I can't bring a chicken. I mean, I just take it off the menu and I don't have chicken on the menu. It really doesn't matter. I mean, mm. hopefully I have something else that I can substitute <laughs> with that my menu is not this short. But uh, uh, <laughs> it, it is challenging sometimes because but you also have really to be cross creative to come up with something and that might be sometimes difficult, but, but I'm so used to it. I have always been, what he's telling me I have been doing, I, I, nowadays I think you have much more choices because you can buy half a beef. But when I started out 33 years ago, I had to buy, I had no choice, I had to make a contract with the farmer and I had to promise him that he grows certain things for me or raises certain animals for me and I had to promise him I would take them and how many I would take. I knew I would, every six months or every, a bit, actually every two months I took a beef, every uh, two weeks I took a veal, every two weeks I took a lamb, every, uh, uh, you know, it's like that. So I had to have the whole animal. And, and uh, I mean, he's absolutely right. What you're stuck with is just, you know, two filet mignons or two tenderloins and two New York strip. And you're stuck with 900 pounds of ground meat. I mean, I thought, <laughs> I thought what I really should do is open a restaurant, a chain called the Groundhog. <laughs> <laughs> because I had ground beef, I mean, beef, pork, lamb, and, uh, and uh, veal. Everything had ground, uh, had ground meat. I mean, beef is the worst. 
I think <laughs> pig is the best. Really, you can use, and the pig is the best. You can use everything on the pig. I mean, you have just your customers to eat it, like the tail and the hooves and <laughs> the ears, the ears. <laughs> but, or the muzzle. But uh, I think, uh, I think uh, with beef, you have the testicles. Yeah, and then you can get you can uh, you can get customers to to yeah, eat it. You just turn it in some different culture food. Like I remember when I put on the first time the a heart of beef and 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 I, I call it you know the, in Peru they have this dish called anticuchos and and so I said anticuchos and to explain what it was I said you know heart of beef you know grilled spicy heart of beef and people actually thought it was the filet mignon. And they ate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I think I think there are challenges. But you know, as I say, I guess that's the advantage of being older. <laughs> that uh, you you have the habit of of improvising and changing things the last minute. I want to ask you one other question. This is in part to see if Jose can can bear not to talk for this long before we get to his I, I, next I'm question. I'm loving to, to, to listen. <laughs> All right, good. Um, I'm practicing when I'm with my wife. So. <laughs> <laughs> She's not here tonight. <laughs> so my question was, was it also working with suppliers to get what you want, you really had to teach them. And I know there's a very good story about ducks and ponds and puddles. <laughs> Um, that maybe you could but tell it was about. in many things. It was in vegetables too. So, you know, when I started out, you know, uh, there were not that many choices. You know, they had the early girl tomatoes and the big Idaho potato and the iceberg lettuce. No, romaine lettuce was like gourmet, gourmet. And uh, so I, I, you know, I brought seeds over. I asked them to grow fingerling potatoes. I brought arugula things. I mean, I, I did a lot for them and. So since we couldn't get organic uh, poultry very easily, we, uh, we tried to find farmers that would raise these animals for us. And so uh, luckily we had a connection in the Amish country in Pennsylvania and, and Roman Stolzfuss. There must be thousands of Stolzfuss in Pennsylvania. They're all called Stolzfuss, but each one is spelled a little differently. And he, he got you know, some friends and neighbors together and taught them how, what to do to become uh, to become certified organic and what they had to do. And so we had a farmer that had, did, he said he will do the ducks for us. So first we had to decide which type, which race with, with, of ducks. So we went to all that and, you know, didn't work out. And then we settled on one duck. And then we told him that, you know, this duck doesn't, still doesn't taste different from anything you can buy in the supermarket. So we told him what these ducks really needed was water. They needed a pond. They needed water to swim in. That's what ducks are supposed to do, right? They're supposed to swim. So he, okay, he said, okay, he will do that. And the next time we went to visit him, we uh, visit my farmer once a year. And uh, he was very proud and showed us the pond he had constructed. And it was like a, like a big swimming pool, this pond. And he said, but the ducks don't go in it. <laughs> So I said, well, you know, they perhaps they have lost their instinct. That's what they're supposed to do. You know, they grow up in cages, you know. So what, they don't know anymore what to do. So we, we created sort of a human chain holding hands and chasing these ducks into the water. <laughs> and uh, well, anyway, they slid into the pond and once were they in there, they are, they were very happy. I mean, they, they it took like ducks to water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I guess I think we are the only restaurant that serves duck with uh, where they actually really swim. And I, I, that has its challenges. It's like grass-fed beef, you know. They work, so it's tougher. It's very flavorful, but it's tougher. And I often get complaints that you know the meat is too tough, the breasts are too tough because. You know, they work these breast muscles. <laughs> so, I, but I think, I, I think it, uh, I think, uh, well, I'm very happy that we could do that and that, you know, it just fits into my philosophy that we should try to go back as more and more to the, to the old fashioned or the natural way of doing things. If it means growing vegetables or if it means raising animals, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a very, I mean, that's just what I feel is the best, the best for the environment and for us best as people. And to tell you about grass-fed, you know, many, many uh, grass-fed uh, animals 
They are contrary to the end. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, they are not 100% grass fed. So many animals, when they say they're, they're, they're grass fed, they are corn fed for the last you know, couple of weeks or so. The difference why, why corn fed, I don't agree with corn fed, is I agree with him, the flavor is very different. And, but animals are ruminants, I mean, beef and the cattle, and they cows, and they have this wonderful, you know, how many stomachs for, and they cannot digest grain. They are meant to eat hay grasses. They are meant to eat grasses, and they get every good little juice out of these grasses. And to be a good grass-fed beef farmer, you have also to be a grass farmer. Because there's grass and grass. There's grass that is just like a weed, and there's grass that's full of protein. And to get really a good grass-fed you know, cattle, you need on your farm also to, to have fields that are uh, dedicated to growing grass. You know, and you change them around, and you have different types of grass and different types of the season, so that uh, your animals always get the right nutrition. And that makes also the grass-fed beef much better tasting. But because if they start eating corn, they cannot digest the corn. And so the only, they, get, they get inflamed. Their stomachs get inflamed. And the only way to keep them from getting too sick is to give them antibiotics. Yeah. And that's why I, don't, I am not for corn-fed beef. If they, if they invent a corn that they can digest, that's a different story. Right. <laughs> well, let me move on um, to Jose. Um, who is definitely a champion of good food, but is less, oh, not always a champion of local, um, a more global vision for your restaurant. So I wonder if you could talk about yeah. those decisions that you make. Well, I mean, um, you know, uh, for me, Nora is like a big hero because I remember it was 14, 15 years ago that your office called me, or you called me. And you told me, Jose, you have to come with me to this trip to Pennsylvania to visit this cop of farmers called Tuscarora. And I think I say no. Then she called me personally. Like, you have to come. So next thing you knew, I was in the bus to go to visit those farmers. And probably for me, it was in, to a degree, was a life changer. Uh, and through the years, I, as you know, I established a great relationship with many of them. Mm -hmm. and, and tell everyone what Tuscarora and is. Tuscarora so is, is a great uh, uh, co-op of uh, farmers uh, created by the owner of a big... Uh, That's co-op in English. Ah, co-op? Co-op. You never understood me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, raise your hand, please. <laughs> I mean, Nora's been talking for 10 minutes, and I thought you understood <laughs> accent. <laughs> So the amazing thing here is that, uh, you know, we know what Nora stands for and what she's been doing is unbelievable. Uh, what Tad has been doing. I pronounce your name well? <laughs> Tad. <laughs> Tad. <laughs> um, but I opened a restaurant that is from Spain, and I do Spanish cooking. And so you're going to come to my restaurant, a Spanish restaurant, and I'm going to send you uh, cheese from Vermont. <laughs> well... You want to come to a Spanish restaurant or you don't? <laughs> so I think at the very beginning, you talk about being uh, kind of finding the middle ground. I call being pragmatic. Mm -hmm. I cannot be in a room with someone that is telling me about localism and then uh, in a very radical way, and then their shoes mm -hmm. are from China, their shirts are from Taiwan, <laughs> and their glasses are from Australia. <laughs> I'm like, listen, if you're going to preach, preach completely or don't preach. So for me, in my restaurants, we really do, especially vegetables, because I'm very amazed that you asked about the meat part, because I do believe that my answer is we need to be eating less and less and less and less meat, but the quality, agreeing to the degree with Nora in big way, being of a higher, higher, higher quality. And these kind of 26 ounces of steaks, they have to be something of the past, not of the future. So we can get three ounces, but being the best three ounces that we can eat, and making sure that the animals are taken care of and so with the, local, uh, with the local movement, I think that's something like not only in America, anywhere in the world, is something we all should be doing. Not only the chefs, but the businesses, the, the supermarkets, people that you have access today to the web to order things that are somehow local. 
But again, the world we live in today was created on the basis of international commerce. We will not be what we are if civilizations across the world over centuries didn't exchange ideas and products. So when I mean to being logical, I only mean is just as much as we can from local. But I'm not going to tell you, if I am a guy that I live in North Canada, and I have to be eating local <laughs> only, believe me, I mean, I will be a very sad person. <laughs> so we only have to be, to a degree, uh, very pragmatic and never go to extremes. Right. Um, uh, so for me, uh, to be going to the market, uh, to the amazing DuPont Circle Market, created by our great aunt, uh, and many of us, we go there, we see each other often there, we know many of the farmers there, we buy there, we go with our families. It's kind of a lifestyle. It's a good, it's a good feeling. It's a great thing. But again, does everyone here go only to a local American restaurant? You like your Italian wine. You like your French champagne. Coffee. You like your coffee from Colombia. <laughs> so we only need to understand certain meanings of what local means. Right. I do believe in the world of vegetables and meats. Maybe we should go more local. But hey, I'm a champion for Iberico pig from Spain. And it's a great story that I'm gonna tell you about how those pigs grow, and how those pigs are part of the environment, eating acorns for the last four months of their life. And they eat a lot of grass, even also they feed them uh, uh, some other <laughs> ingredients. Uh, but the truth is that I don't want a bee not part of bringing that amazing pig uh, to America when I have the opportunity. And not for that, I feel the sinner. And if I do, I'm a Catholic, I go Sunday to Mass, and uh, everything is resolved. <laughs> okay. But I only want to put the end to, we need to be very pragmatic in the way we think on those issues. I think local is the way to go in so many ways. But we only need to understand the parameters of what that local means. Yeah. Because I want to have wines in my wine list from everywhere else around the world. Yeah, I think that everybody is, you know, there is this extremism um, about it. And, and, and what I find, I mean, as a reporter, is that everybody is fine to be extreme as long as you have to make the change. All right. If it, if it changes what I have to do, where I have to shop, and what I have to be doing, or it's a little less convenient, it's not quite as interesting, but it would be really nice if you would fix sure. that for me. I don't know if you ever feel like that as chefs, that people expect you to do more than they might be willing to do, or maybe that's not the issue. Um, for example, with, um, uh, with fish, I have a story of receiving letter after letter because I had shark on the menu which is a very traditional dish in the south of Spain. And, um, and I had shark until probably five years ago. I received a few letters from a few, um, from few guests. I, I um, received um, a letter from uh, the Monterrey Aquarium. I was, and at the end, the truth is that at the end, at the end of the question, my decision was, let's make that choice of taking shark out of the menu. Yes, it's a tradition where I come from, yes, it's, but at the end, it didn't make much sense for reasons we, we don't have time to speak now. So, so on that end, yes, sometimes you feel like someone is pushing you to do things, sometimes it's good. We have the same issue with foie gras, and we know there's certain legislation coming in certain states in the years to come, California, etc. certain chefs that they decided to take that out of the menu. We can start going ingredient by ingredient like that, and, so the, what is very amazing is that we have this conversation happening. And the only thing I hope is that every time these conversations arise, that we, we put everything in the right context. And we listen to everyone. Because we need to understand that when we decide to take something out of the menu, we have huge implications that go beyond our menu and our product. It's going to be families in another part of the world that they are going to be running out of a job to do. Because maybe they are a fishing village that the only thing they do is catching tunas. Yes, it's OK. Maybe the tunas, we should stop catching them, because if not, tunas are going to be disappearing, especially the bluefin tuna. I can give you an example of a town. I go every day year for summer where it's a big problem, because that town lives out of tuna. So if they stop fishing tuna, what that town is going to do? So if we is going to be an international ban on fishing tuna, I may support it, because tuna is in danger. 
but we cannot take this decision without, without understanding that there's gonna be around 5,000 families that the way of living is ending. So before we do that, we need to put in consideration these other issues, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Does anyone else wanna jump in on that? Uh, or? You know, we, it's, it's like the, the fish plight um, we were together today, you know, about a, uh, a dilemma in, uh, in Alaska with the sockeye salmon, and um, the largest sockeye salmon producing body of water in the world is in danger due to some uh, mining interests that are interests that are actually outside the United States that are driven from South Africa and Canada and England. And there, there are, and yesterday it was, I, I, I picked up all this wild salmon and I happened to be in New York and I went and met this gentleman who very interesting, makes wine in Brooklyn at the Red Hook Winery. It's an urban winery. Okay. He's a fifth generation salmon fisherman by summer and winemaker by off season. <laughs> and, and really a very interesting, but so I went and I got the salmon and we're, it's a salmon week around Washington so you should try to support it. And um, just to, to, to understand that, you know, that there are generations of, of uh, Americans and Native Americans that are at stake, livelihoods and families and the ability to send children to school and provide food for them. Um, it, it, it's, uh, there, there are definitely some scary economic and eco challenges out there that we as chefs, being in the forefront and often having to be people that are voices for it, have to try to decide what the choices are right, like Jose said, but sometimes those decisions are there are two right sides and two wrong sides. And um, those are things that I think that people ask of us sometimes that make it challenging for us. And Do you ever just feel like, this is not my, I'm just making dinner. I, I don't have all the answers to these things. I'm sorry. Or do you think it's exhilarating? Um, I think that it's a reality. I think that uh, you can be the you can be the chef that wants to stay in his cage and be chained to his range and do his thing. and. There are thousands and thousands of them, and some are, there are some of them are in all of us, and we are all of the same, cut from the same cloth, and we all are very, very different spirits as cooks. But um, certainly in a city like Washington, you get called on by countless <laughs> organizations to do things, right. and, and so, right. but they are for our clientele, and without me doing things for my clientele. They support our restaurant on a regular basis. I'm sure many of you do, and I thank you very much because it helps pay bills and helps me employ people. And, and uh, so we do the things that are necessary and, and uh, without sacrificing what I think is integrity and sacrificing our passion. And I think that's, in the end of the day, that's what's key. But you know, uh, you know it's very interesting, the two examples, because what uh, Jose is saying is that it's the fisherman that will be out of business because he doesn't buy their fish anymore. And what he's saying is that the fisherman will be out of business because another industry comes in. So two different things because, well, at the end result is the same, the fish get decimated. But I think what you're saying, Jose, is that it's very short-sighted because if there are no more tuna to fish, then the fishermen are out of work anyway. So it's just a question of timing. You can buy their, their tuna as long as you want, but you will see in five years they, they will not have any more tuna to sell you, so they have to change. So basically what you're trying to tell them, think now already about changing your boat. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I know the boats are specifically for tuna fishing, and it's, uh, but I mean you have to change because you have outfished. Well, your your bread basically, your, what gives you your livelihood. I mean, it's 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 there's there's no more there's no more fish out there, and that's why these people of the of the Bristol Bay are scared. Is that they are saying that if this unbelievable mine, they call it the, what's called the pebble mine, and it's an enormous. It's like two miles long. I mean, it's like the size is enormous. They, uh, when they create that, it will destroy all the water, the ground, the grounds will sink, all these chemicals that they use for the mining will sink in the water, it will go into the rivers, it, the spawn, spawning grounds of these fish, and at the end, 
it will decimate the fish and they won't have any more fish and they are fighting against it now because they have seen it happen. It's happening everywhere that we have flowers. So I think, I think, uh, I mean, it's just for me, it's a decision to make the decision now not to support it. And uh, maybe there is a hope that the fish survives and perhaps that the fishermen can change their, their métier. I mean, uh, you know, become, you know, geared towards another direction or, or uh, do you support them and buy the fish until there's no more fish? I mean, we have ba barely any wild fish left. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but you all eat farmed fish. And farmed fish is, is as bad as farmed animals. You know, they have to use a lot of uh, additives, chemical additives to make this fish grow at the price that you eat your food. And so it's, it, it's like a vicious cycle. Let me um, switch gears a little bit here because I think we could probably go species by species and talk about <laughs> all the scary things that are happening. Um, but I wanted to come back to what Spike had alluded to earlier, which was about this balance between doing good in your restaurant and doing good outside of your restaurant and the role that chefs take in different areas. And so, you know, I think what you were saying is, look, I serve burgers, but I also go out and talk to kids. So tell us a little bit sure. about what you do with the kids in DC in particular. I mean, I guess for, for, for me, like I said, it's, it's about balance, balance in, in the restaurant. And again, I, I can't buy grass-fed beef to support you know, all the customers that I serve on, on a daily basis. It would just be impossible. Uh, but I do support and I respect what Nora does and you know what all the chefs do. And you know my way to giving back is to be on board like an organization like Let's Move.org, Michelle Obama's initiative, where you know you're going into schools and and you're preaching and you're talking about what we're, we're talking about on this panel and you're doing demonstrations with the kids. And um, you know I, the thing I think that's really important is to kind of get kids to understand where their food come from, mm -hmm. com comes from, that a chicken doesn't come from the supermarket. You know, one of my like, questions I always ask in a public school is like, where does your chicken come from? And you know, more than half the students are gonna say, Whole Foods or you know, Safeway or something like that. So, you know, and that's kind of a little bit disheartening for, for me. So my goal is, is, is to make food fun, approachable, approachable and get, get kids' hands dirty with, with uh, you know, like planting rooftop gardens. So you do. work at, what, which school do you work at? Well, you know, when I was first asked to join, we all decided to adopt certain schools in the district, and I chose KIPP Academy. Uh, it's a charter school. Um, they have about 86 charter schools across the United States. Um, it's a private charter school. Uh, the ed education program is really amazing, um, but the food pr program kind of sucks. I mean, it's kind of like even the public schools. So, um, you know, my job is to go in there, uh, get parents and students together, and uh, do food demonstrations. Like, for instance, I'll go in with a cucumber, a tomato, some olive oil, a little bit of uh, oregano, and I'll just make, you know, uh, a salad. And, um, you know, more than just making a salad, I feel it's the importance of, like, okay, look, this is a tomato that comes from a farm. This is a cucumber that comes from a farm. And these are raw, pure ingredients, and you can just make a beautiful salad yourself. Um, the reason I asked for the parents to come to the demonstrations is because, you know, as a chef, you can go in these schools and you can preach to, to kids as much as you want. But if they're really not getting the same support or information from home, if they go back home and they're not, you know, the parents don't know about what we just did, it's just there's no purpose of the whole entire lesson. So I, I really, you know, the students can at, cannot attend the demo without actually having a parent bring them uh, because I think it's equally as important to educate the parents that don't have the tools. Um, and what kind of questions do you get from the parents? I'm, you know, what kind of questions? Um, God, I mean, it's 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 all over the place. Um, I mean, are they receptive, or do they feel like well, you are saying the, the you're a bad parent the, somehow? Deep, no, I don't. Deep down, I, I don't think it's that. You know, they're, I'm not telling them they're bad parents. I, I just think that it's the lack of education or time. I mean. Most of these families aren't that fortunate, and they struggle to send their kids to school, and, and they're usually carrying three or four jobs. Food just kind of falls on the bottom of the of priority list, which is a little bit, you know, it's not the best thing. So my job is there, just like, listen, it's a little bit easier than you think. You know, sharp, I mean, sharp, shop locally, go to farmer's markets. Uh, often they ask me, you know, how they can apply food stamps to supermarkets. Uh, and, you know, just cook home-cooked meals instead of making it Taco Bell Tuesday or Chick-fil-A Wednesday or, or, or Burger King Thursday, you know, which most of them, you'd be surprised, is that parents have, you know, have their schedules on dinners around 
it's going to be Taco Bell Tuesday today. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of disheartening to see that's, that's what their students, you know, are going through. I mean, I remember when I was going to school, um, we were doing the same thing at school that the school was providing us with, 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 like, tacos on Wednesday. Right. And, like, they were providing us with, like, checkers on Thursday. And, and, you know, looking back on it, that's kind of horrifying. So, you know, going to the schools and kind of laying a little bit of a foundation, um, you know, it, it is really important. And, I mean, it, we're just at the beginning of it. I mean, there's a lot of hard work to do. The, the first, you know, the first initiative was to get, get into the school, ask a bunch of questions, see what's going on, and see how, you know, as chefs, we can, we can just improve things little by little. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm doing personally is we're launching, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're launching Good Stuff Gardens. Uh, which we're planning, you know, one by one. I'm going to Kip Academies, uh, you know, starting in D.C., and we're planning rooftop gardens with the kids. Uh, you know, most of the, like, some of the best students get to participate with the high scores, and um, it's exactly what we do. It's simple. We plant tomatoes. We plant herbs, uh, cucumbers, squash. Uh, we'll harvest some of this stuff. Uh, you know, we won't have enough to make a meals, but, right. you know, we can do d demonstrations. So. And, and, Jose, you have a plan going on in a certain school. You want to tell us about what you've yeah, got cooking? Yeah, well, let me tell you. Um, I think uh, chefs, as parents, we are all very involved with our kids at home, uh, directly and directly, and trying to influence them and, and understand the, the power of food. I think uh, one of the great things that happened this last year was uh, when the White House invited a thousand chefs uh, with the, the magnificent, the great speech that uh, Todd gave. Um, uh, to the, tonight we have here Sam Cass that very much is behind the First Lady. And thanks to him, we, we are seeing uh, more and more the importance of food in the Obama administration. So I really want to be thanking Sam for all uh, his initiatives in moving food in the front line. So on, 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 on policy and, and, and talking about importance in our lives. Um, so... Uh, myself, I, I've been going to a whole bunch of schools. Uh, everyone knows me. I cannot be with, uh, seated in the same place. And, and I've been doing a, a lot of things, from teaching kids uh, to science in this school, to going to my children, the Woods Academy in, uh, Academy in Bethesda, to talk about food and the science, and finding fun ways to tell kids about the importance of food, because education has to be fun. So. Uh, I've been going a lot for the last few years trying to understand how do we convince kids that food is important. And uh, I learned by listening to people that are experts in these fields that education is important. But we have two big challenges. A, we don't teach anything in relationship to food in the schools of America or in the schools of the world. And that's wrong. I don't mean French is not important, but I'm sorry to Frenchmen, food is more important than learning French. Spanish? Or Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> By that, I don't mean that kids should, on, should not have two or three languages. But food is very important. But somehow, food is not in the curriculums of America or Europe. Even we can talk about certain things that happen in France, certain things that happen in England, but it's not in the curriculum. So, second, we are not talking about the, uh, I can tell you, schools here that cost $30,000 a year. Some of the best schools in the country. And not precisely. Those schools are serving also the best food. So even families that are wealthy, making a ton of money a year or more, their kids are unhealthy. But I'm not so worried about those. Because if those kids are not eating well, it's by decision. Unfortunate decision of their parents. The kids we're talking about are those kids that have no option. Because even if the fathers and mothers wanted to feed them better, they don't have the money to be fed better. So here we are relying on a school lunch program and whatever help we are providing to feed those children. And we see that with the money we have on the table, you can send the 100 best chefs to the 100 best schools. And people, only Jesus was able to multiply bread and sardines. Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, so, as we know. Said that, said that, I do believe, yes, it's very important that we have many, many hundreds, thanks to the Let's Move initiative of chefs going around the country, that was a great first step into making something happen. At the end of the day, chefs, 
We know how to feed people, and probably we can do a very good job. But many other things are going to be having to change at the very top to really have a real influence down, down in the bottom. So one of the things we are start talking, thanks to uh, Mr. Steve Knapp, and thank you to Diane, his wife, who, who is very much the one that put together this Food Urban Task Force, and uh, we thank you very much for making this night uh, happen, is we are really discussing if we don't need to be creating uh, kind of a food institute to start bringing all the issues in relationship to food in the world, public policy, foreign policy, education. So education is a very important one. So we've been talking if why we don't start creating kind of maybe a curriculum that involves education, food, and science, where almost you develop a curriculum from first, uh, first grade to eighth grade, where somehow you teach science, almost like what we did in Harvard, but for kids that go from first to eighth. And how much you do a curriculum that because you don't want to fight with every single education board in the country, you create the curriculum and you put it there through the net, through books, through different ways to make sure that this is available to the teachers. Because in five years, 10 years, we're going to have an issue. 20 years, we're going to have an issue. And if Congress, Senate, the education boards, the governors, the states don't act, the problem is going to be there, and the problem is going to be huge. So if we had that curriculum, we're going to have probably teachers, slowly, that they're going to see that they can be plan of the solution. Right. If they don't have the, the money to feed them well, at least you can be, start planting the seed in those kids of why eating this is more important for you and your future than eating this other food. Right. So at the end, you give the kids almost the power and the tools for themselves on their own be making the right decisions and pushing for real change. Yeah, you give them the value because you can put whatever you want in front of them, but if they don't value something better, yeah. you know, there's nothing you can do. I want to switch gears here. I have some questions that came in from students, um, and this is a total change of what we've been talking about, and I'm going to just throw it open to anyone to answer, um, which is, what would you say has been your most humbling experience in the time that you have been in the culinary industry? And we're looking for really embarrassing stories. I mean, I think being on this panel right now is pretty humble. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, I mean, I'll go ahead. I mean, you know, the one of my uh, I worked in France for about a year and a half in a, in a chateau in the north of France called Les Crayers, and uh, there was a gentleman named uh, Gerard Boyer. He was a famous chef. He had three Michelin stars for about twenty years, and. Uh, it took me about nine months to get um, my, my externship there. Uh, you know, nonstop phone calls at 3 o'clock in the morning to him at 9 o'clock where he just, you know, eventually just, he's like, all right, we'll send you the acceptance papers. We'll get you there. And uh, I was the only American kid out of 60 French uh, chefs. And, I mean, I just got my, you know, I got my butt kicked. And it was uh, a really humbling experience because, you know, the thing about working in France with the, with the French, it's that they really do have an appreciation for product and food. And it's something that they really, um, you know, they get raised with. Uh, you know, like, you know, most of them come from, like, little small villages where, you know, the bread is, the bread is baked across the street and, you know, the cheese is coming from the cow from, you know, down, down the way and, and this. So that whole entire, um, you know, idea was, was just amazing for me. I just, I just took a lot away from that. And coming back to the States, it kind of set my goals for what I want to do. Can I ask a follow-up question? So do you, do you speak French? Oui, je parle français. Oh, OK. Because yeah. I always wondered how people go into those restaurants. You know, everybody stages at El Bouilly, and, and like they don't speak Spanish. How does everybody? Well, food is, is a common just, language. You just yell and throw pots, and everybody grunting. understands. Yeah, grunting, grunting. yeah. Right. OK. Beating on chest. All right. right. Just <laughs> <laughs> OK, and one other question from a student. Um, uh, what is the best kept food secret in DC? Ooh, I got that one nailed down. I'd have to say, uh, lately, it's Rosa in Columbia oh. Heights. Oh, yes. OK, good. I wanted you to tell uh, this story. Where it's, um, you know, it's, it's amazing, actually. It's, it's the best Mexican food I've had. Have you been here to Rosa's yet? No, no? we'll have to take you. The, uh, the, uh, it's, uh, you know, you go to Columbia Heights, you get this address, 
It's a little bit, you know, off the beaten path. Um, we can't tell you what the address is. Yeah, we can't is, tell you. I, I, I just heard she has a Facebook page, though, now. So it's kind of, <laughs> it's all over. Right. Um, you just, so last week. You call a phone number. You're sitting in front of this apartment. You call a phone number. Rosa answers the phone. She says, are you there? And you go, yes, I'm here. And she, uh, she throws keys out of her window. Uh, and you catch the keys. Um, you let yourself into the apartment building. You go up to the uh, you know, apartment 212 or 211. And uh, you walk into this studio apartment where Rosa and her husband, were, which is wearing a chef coat, and uh, you know, her son are you know, serving a table of eight. There's just one table. It's a community table. It's got all the, you know, the, the salsas, the, the uh, chipotes <laughs> on the table, the, the radishes in water. And it doesn't matter how many people she has in there, you're, you're welcome to eat, whether you're just standing in the studio or she's moving around some family. And uh, it's, you know, if you can get a hold of the number, it's, it's, it's definitely a visit. Oh, it's not this America Most Wanted kind of show? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, it could go either way, I think. Does she throw the check out the window too when you're done? Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, what does this experience right. cost you? Uh, it's it's um I'd say it's 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 very cheap. I mean she's she's doing an honest living, uh, you know, and and um, I have to admit the I haven't had except for Oya of course I haven't had tacos as yeah. good as good as, <laughs> as good as this. Uh, as good as these. My and, corn is organic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Comes from Oaxaca, and I can right, tell you right. the farmer. <laughs> Or because you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, right. it's 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 amazing. You know what they do food. it like that in Cuba. Yeah? yeah. In Cuba, you have the what is it called? The paladares. 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 Yeah. Okay. And yeah. you go to people's homes and you basically yeah. you eat in the in the dining room. Paladares. Yeah. I couldn't I mean, go to Cuba because I'm a green yeah. card holder and I receive a letter from the State Department. Yeah, you get blacklisted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm about to become American citizen, but man, it's difficult to go places with a green card. <laughs> But it's not open. You cannot fly from Miami. Yeah. You can, open, you can fly now from it's, Miami. Now it's new. That's I don't know. Every time I go, the they I buy a ticket, they find out. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep an eye on Jose. Anybody else have a good hidden food secret for our audience? One more. I kind of want to hear the humbling. Uh, this, humbling uh, or a this. food secret? One more. Humbling. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that my daughters, uh, the other day, a year ago, I was like, you know, we always talk about, okay, what's your favorite restaurant, Bob? And my second one, Ines, which she's the chef in the family, nine years old. No, sorry, she's 10 now. Uh, <laughs> she goes, Daddy, the bread tomato at Jaleo, I like it, but I prefer the margarita to Amy's. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, this is a free country, you have decision. To this kind of puts you in place. They are always <laughs> checking. Right. Daddy, this chicken at your restaurant is okay, but the one we had there was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they are always, they are always. The best part is when they tell me, Daddy, Daddy, let's go to McDonald's. I heard they have a new burger. We need to do research. <laughs> it's, uh, they, they, it's amazing how they learn. <laughs> <laughs> Never go, but. No, a serious humbling experience is only when you go sometimes to these Amish farmers and you see, yeah. you see they are like 30 years old and they have like 11 kids and, and, and how, how, how they, they, they live, you know? And then the little kids, they have already, the three-year-old has already tasks that they feed the chickens every morning, you know? It's like, I think it's very humbling to see how, how they live very simple lives. And, and how hard they work. Yeah. And how, how Makes you not basically want to they work all their lives. Yeah. Yeah. From the small arm. Yeah. I are, think that... Yeah. They were hard. You yeah. feel terrible. You feel terrible not finishing your plate of food or, yeah. or you know, spending money on shoes that cost $200 or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, switching gears just to keep this Lively, um, a question I had, this is in terms of sustainability questions, and I am asking this with trepidation as a former writer at the Washington Post who used to cover the restaurant scene. Does the media help or do they hurt? You are the worst. I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why don't you just move on to the next question? No, I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, you, we, they build people up, you know, particularly with sustainability. They, they like, one thing we love to do as reporters is oversimplify things and, you know, you, this is right and this is wrong and this is black and this is white. Um, how do you feel the media's coverage of sustainability and chefs has helped you do what you do or, or been a hindrance? I think at some point, I think some of the coverage gets to be a little, um, well, the, the word is abused. I mean, the word, the, the word sustainable. I mean, it has so many different meanings. And someone asked me about, you know, how sustainable is, you know, the, the dishes the, the, or the, the products that we're using. And, um, I mean, if we talk about what sustainability is, I mean, does it have duration over time does it, without exhausting um, physical and ecolo ecological resources? I mean, I'm sure there's a, there's a pr plenty of professionals in here that can tighten that definition down for me. And then my wife said, you make sure you look that definition up before you go. Mm -hmm. But you know what? And, and I'm, you know, not, not you, of course. You never took any cheap shots, but... Um, I think that me. there is. <laughs> Try well, to be conscientious. We were speaking Try to about be equal it. opportunity well, on we, the cheap shots. Right, right, right. But we were speaking about in the in, in the back about you know the way that often people are writing about things that want to be controversial, that want to that, that controversy sells, and maybe someone that might think they're sustainable, if we can make it a little controversial, that they're not sustainable, can be very appealing to people, and I think. Someone asked me about it at an event last year, and I said, you know, to me what sustainability in my world means, and we all have our own small worlds that we live in, you know, sustainability to me is, is about my business and about what a restaurant should be. Is my restaurant sustainable? It's certainly a, a, a place that busboys are able themselves to buy homes, start families, have children, People meet, get married, have children, carriages around the restaurant. Um, decades go by, or 12 years, in Nora's case, 30. I mean, that to me is what, and that, and that in my world is sustainability. Sustainability to me means, and, and that's, so, I mean, I think that the, to get So you back think to we focus question. too much on the environment and the yeah. eco-friendly, not so much on the business and the people? It's a sustainable lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, as a whole. But I think overall the press has been, I mean, I mean, what the job you did at Washington Post, Edward Klein, Mark Bittman, Michael Pollan, Marion Nestle, on all the fundamental issues and relationship with food. But unfortunately, we cannot think only about Washington, about Maryland, Virginia, or about the states. Uh, we are on a planet Earth that everything is more, more united, and everything that happens in one part of the world somehow influences something else around the world, somewhere else, on every issue. Every decision we are making in Washington, well, everyone at their homes, well, a senator, well, a chef deciding what he puts on the menu. Every one of those decisions, when you put them all together in a big bag, somehow they have a huge influence in what may happen somewhere else. This last year that I spent some time in Haiti, you may think that because we are giving food for free, we all should be feeling good because we really did help. And we, as America and the international community, came in the help of Haiti in a big way. One of the issues is we brought with us huge amounts of food. Corn was one of them, rice was one of them. You may feel good because you gave to people that on paper were in need. You may argue that at the beginning they need food. But when you still are giving food three months, six months later, when you are talking about a country that is 75% relying on the local farming, if you keep throwing free food, what you did in the process of helping was annihilating, stopping the only thing that actually was running in that country. So here we are giving, and we're feeling good, but we need to start thinking about smart giving. And more often than not, we are throwing money into the issues, into the problems, instead of be investing in the solutions. Why do we give so much? Well, now we don't even have the time. But we give the corn, we give the rice. Right. Much of that is subsidized. The United Nations buy that from many American farmers, which are not the little farmer, are the huge farmers that somehow 
the richest farmers in the country are feeding the poorest people in Haiti. And in the process, they are getting rich, and we are killing the local economy. So, you know, I agree with you. I should have written that, that story. Sustainability means many, many, many things. But I think part of what here you are doing, moderating this panel and people being on there, listening to what for chefs we have to see, is that the true power of food with its connections to everything, and I mean everything, national security, public policy, foreign policy, education, health, all these connections, we are gonna have to start having really, really deep talks and not only focusing in one thing without seeing the influences of everything else around. So the long story short, Jess, you're doing a great job informing, we'll just cut it off right informing us Informing many of us, it's been great journalism, great videos, great documentaries, which are bringing different aspects of the issues. And hopefully, more and more, we're gonna be more prepared to kind of even keep making better decisions that help us to go, keep moving forward using food as a real tool of empowering not only our communities, but this country and, and the world, and, that, and that's the issue. Yeah, I mean, I think that this, that, that, that this focus on conflict, and there's plenty of reasonable conflict out there that we don't focus on. We focus on little conflicts. And what Todd and I were talking about, what he alluded to in the back as I was saying, I have this great idea for a reality TV show. And the reality TV show was, this is my pitch. No, it's not really. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, was to sort of really show people and help them in, in changing the way that they eat, not make them work out on the treadmill, you know, for an hour long and oh you lost 60 pounds but who works out seven hours a day and so I ran it by somebody and they said um, they said but there's no humiliation there's no I mean nobody's nobody's degraded or humiliated and yeah. I said well right but that's the point and they said well that'll never sell so um, right. so I you know I just think that you know to a certain extent this were, and I was curious sort of what you thought because you know the com competitive chefs and you know kitchen stadium and arenas, and there's so much focus on this kind of stuff. There's a lot of focus on sustainability too, but we tend to like the nasty part. Right. I mean, so if we can get the Jersey Shore crew to think sustainability, I think we're, I That's think we're money. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll pitch that yeah. instead. <laughs> Snooky goes sustainable. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. Nice. But you should not give up on your ideas. Things change, you know. People might have said it's a, it will never go. But you don't, uh, there's so many people that ask all the time, how can I do it? How can I eat more organically? How can I eat healthier at home? So I think often people that sit in these uh, chairs that make the decision what works and what doesn't work, uh, they, their goals are so different. Their goals is only the money point or the dollar sign or the, the, the amount of viewers he has on the show without, without realizing that around him life has changed and that perhaps now it's time to give this to the people and it will bring dollars. Well, you must have felt like you were a voice in the wilderness back in the day. I mean, you know, where you said exactly. organic restaurant? <laughs> so, <just> What's that? <laughs> a biology class? <laughs> yeah. Well, we are, um, I want to leave some time for some questions. So I believe we have a microphone here and we have a second yeah, microphone? The, Just the, the one, I think. OK, so if you have a question yeah, right. yeah, and you'd like to sort of come around yeah, and stand up behind, we'll just take like, questions um, one at a time. If like, you could just uh, um, tell us your like, name uh, and that's guy that's got, like, who uh, your question good. is for. Good evening. My name's Todd Wiggins. Good to meet all of you. I've met all of you individually. I uh, want to say congratulations for what you've achieved. You're all innovators in your enterprises and your thought processes. But we are here in Washington, D.C., which is considered to be conservative because we are the seat of the federal government. What do you do that you feel is comparable to any New York artist, L.A. artist, Miami, wherever you want to choose, Madrid, wherever you want to choose? Uh, um, Barcelona. 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 <laughs> even better. Even better. Gaudi, Sada Grafimi, I understand. I understand what you're saying. You're a great orator, by the way. <laughs> I saw you on 16th Street at a recent house party. You were fantastic. Mm -hmm. You stole the show. In a house party? Yeah, it was a house party. I was drinking, yeah. yeah you're good. <laughs> How do you compare to New York? Let's say, I'll give you an arbitrary example. Rocco Despirito, you know, the 
reality uh, TV yeah. uh, mm-hmm. specialists. No, How do you compare? Local. Could we do <laughs> reality TV out of New York? Yeah. Out of DC, I mean. Hopefully but, we don't <laughs> resemble anything <laughs> like has anything Rocco, to yeah. do with Rocco Despiro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. He's a good friend of uh, Jose's. I like uh, Rocco. I know you do. But, yeah. No, no, Ro- Rocco is a great guy. He's a, he's he's a great but guy. Rocco is the perfect example of media having a bad influence <laughs> yes. well, no, on people. Yeah. Rocco true. was in the cover of a top magazine. And the day he was in the cover on that top magazine, barely a year and a half after he began, kind of he had a difficulty in life. Right. Because he was a heck of a chef when he was running his restaurant. Become like an immediate success. And this is one of the issues of the press. Uh, every press, TV, anything that has to do with communicating, that we are in this moment of creating these uh, heroes, almost like instant potato puree on flakes. <laughs> you add the water and bingo, look at I'm a cook. <laughs> Say, you are not a cook, you are a good mixer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, so, but, but I retract question... my, dis- my statement about Rocco. No, I know I you like do. I know. And me too. I because I, I always give him bunches. When, when Rocco was cooking on Park Avenue, he Correct. was doing some Amazing. beautiful, the best beautiful restaurant work. work. But, but, but I think absolutely. we all agree that we have Washington, we're a small town. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, but, 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 uh, the burger I eat in his restaurant is unbelievable. When I, I, I have the chance to eat it. In your restaurant, that is amazing. Even I know I've been a few months without going. Uh, Nora, <laughs> it's been a long time, I don't know, to yours. But yeah, the many times I've been with my wife, always, even I was afraid to use the napkin because it was organic. I'm like, what do I do with it? <laughs> right. What, what do I do? Eat it. So, so I think Washington, we have some of the best. What happened, we don't have hundreds of each. But from Japanese to Italian to American to burger to... to but so, but so the question is, is Washington too conservative a city for you to be artists? I, I mean, I, I don't think so at all. I mean, I, th- I, think, um, I think we owe a lot to the new, new administration when they, they took office because they, uh, they really showed the initiative and uh, the draw towards food and that they were foodies. They went out, they went out eating. Uh, they showed their interests. And I think that, you know, was appealing to a lot of chefs. I mean, I think, uh, you know, since then, a lot of chefs have been trying to come to D.C. and open up their restaurants. And I think in the last three years, you've seen, you know, a lot of neighborhoods with new restaurants around it, like a huge amount. Emerg- in the last 10 years. I think oh, the last it, 10 years. So it has so many restaurants now. It's yeah. unbelievable. I think that many people feel there's a big turn. And I think there could be a TV show about Washington. But, right. Especially it because it's such a mix of, of, of cultures, yeah. too. Yeah. You know, we have a big Vietnamese section. We have an Ethiopian section. You know, I, I don't that the Chinese sort of disappeared with the, the Korean section, but yeah. you know, there are all these different sections. I think uh, it would be very interesting to do a show here in Washington yeah. to show the melting pot of all this and mixing in all the steakhouses that the government. Uh, uh, supports the federal government. Okay, so you, we have, have, you have the feeling that the only thing they know how to eat is steak and baked potatoes. No. But, but it's changed so much because what was what was probably considered very conservative in the past years and in my days when I cooked on La Colline back in the late 80s and early 90s and um, I mean you have a younger audience and a deeper audience now for the, the parts of Washington, the 14th Street Corridor I'm opening up in Noma, where five years ago you wouldn't have gone there without a police escort. And it's just amazing the, the pockets of town, like Nora was saying, that have changed. And I think a lot of it is, honestly, and, and Jose, you've been a driving force on, on opening multi-concepts in this city. And I think that a lot of times we are, we're challenged with, um, I'll just say it. I mean, we're challenged with other cities, chefs that come in and put in that, their landmark name and they put in somebody and boom, they're gone. And they visit, when they visit Washington, they all ask us to come to the restaurant and they have a little powwow for us and they shake it. And I mean, it can be a bit insulting for us that spend 14 hours a day, year after year, trying to make this as good of a city as it can be from a dining, from, from, from our world. And... Uh, I think we're expanding. I think we're making the city a better place to eat. And Spike, and there are new chefs that are coming to town that are staying in the city. And I'm not talking about visit chefs that come to Washington. I'm talking about chefs that come yeah. to Washington and stamp something and leave. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what t- turns us off. And uh, right, yeah. we have but, lots but, of questions. But he asked, he asked about art. 
I, I will invite you to go to um, uh, the Washington Post. Dot com <laughs> and and they are uh, the art critic Gopnik. Gopnik? Oh yeah, Blake Gopnik. Blake, he did a great piece on asking himself, is food art or art can be food? And he did a great piece uh, and he brought a great article and he did a video. In this case, he used mini bar and and few dishes I did inspire on the on Del Chihuly in Seattle when I worked with him. So go there and. You'll find the answer on your own, hopefully. <laughs> OK, so sorry, next question so we have room. We'll have to keep our answer short. We have. Hi, my name is Anita Davidson, and I'm a sophomore here at the university. Um, and I just want to say thank you all for being here. It's been a pleasure, and I love eating at all of your restaurants. However, uh, my dad only comes to the city <laughs> a few times during the year to take me out to eat. and so. You know, listening to you guys talk about your education initiatives with food, I was wondering if you could offer, if you had any suggestions to offer the university on how they can improve the food in our mandatory, mandatory dining um, facilities. Thank you. Would you like to tell us what you have in your mandatory dining facilities? Um, well, as a freshman, you have $700 that you have to spend in uh, J Street, which is right across the street, and also in Ames on the other campus. And in J Street, there's a Wendy's, there's a fast food Chinese place, there is um, a fast food kosher place, and uh, a fast food Mexican slash pizza place slash breakfast. And then we also have a salad bar with some prepared food, and then a sandwich bar. Wow. Uh, I, I, do, do, yeah. Are you approved revolt. to be next year in the university? I don't, I don't know after this no, question. It, it's to answer you one thing or another and help you to be next. That, that's a good question, uh, and, and it's great that, because what you're doing right now is what should be happening in the schools and universities one day across America, where children and, or better. students speak up about, because I think everyone is very willing to listen. Obviously, you see here the initiative of Mr. Knapp doing a forum like this. Already you see that this something happened. Already you see that the university has created this kind of a forum to start talking about the meaning of food and how we can improve our lives through food. So something is boiling, something is happening. I hope in the next few months we, we can be announcing that I hope I'm gonna become kind of a food advisor to Mr. Knapp in some form, and I hope that this will mean- No pressure, no pressure. And I hope that this will mean that slowly, slowly, with the help of many, we can be doing a business. Can be DC Central Kitchen, one of the best organizations in the country, creating opportunity and fighting hunger, creating jobs where right now they're feeding seven schools, seven charter schools in the district, doing it amazingly well at the very good pricing with fresh local vegetables. With, so it's ways. I think that what you are seeing is that organizations are understanding that they have to go ahead of the curve. They have to be moving forward. So what you need to be doing and everyone else is almost to be knocking in the door of Mr. Knapp, because I know he's listening. <laughs> because if not, we wouldn't be here today. Right. What happened, change takes time, but also takes brave people to speak up in forums saying exactly what's wrong. So we can all together change it. Thank can you. I, um, I'm gonna go to the next question so we make sure we have time, but I wanna say also that there's um, someone, Melissa over here we know is starting a food co-op, we hope, a restaurant, cafe, co-op cafe possibly at the Hillel Center, so talk to her about good food. Kitchen incubator, Kitchen incubator at the Hillel, <laughs> new Hillel Center, possibly with rooftop garden. Hi, this is Melissa. <laughs> okay, so what's your next Thanks. question? Next Hi guys, question. thank you for being here. Um, so, I sort of touched on um, the issue of cutting down meat in, in diets and stuff like that, and cutting down the amount of meat. And my um, vegan and vegetarian friends call me a hypocrite all the time, when I talk about food sustainability because they believe that you can't be sustainable and still eat meat. And I was just wondering if you guys would touch on that and how you reconcile like love of food, love of diversity of product and th that kind of thing while also wanting to be carnivore. Are you a vegan? Um, mm. I have been for periods of time. I'm currently a vegetarian, but that's only for Lent. Great. I love food too much. That's I love right. food far too much. I know. I, I think I saw it on the burger place the other day. I got, uh, I got the mushroom I burger. I, I got the mushroom yeah. burger. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice try. Is she your PR? I know. I know. She's not. She's, I think she's a customer, though. Your, your friends say that you can't be sustainable and eat meat? 
that's I um I have a very strongly he, I think he's now a raw vegan and very very extreme to that end. He 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 called me out for for supporting what Jamie Oliver's doing because he said that he's not going far enough by also still eating meat. And I, this is this is one person I've talked to, but it's it's a pretty common view that he, that. He, this is he probably needs body. to take a farm ride. <laughs> I mean, if I can, real quick, yes, because please. I mean, um, the, the things that we're all so passionate about and what we do every day, and the people that we like to talk to on the phone, and the people we like to buy from, and the, the eyes we like to look into when we buy the food and go out and see the farms that we work with, and to farms like Tuscarora and Path Valley, and people in the Plains, Virginia, and the Blue Ridge, and our watermen, and everything. I would love to meet this character because I, that's wrong <laughs> of him to say that because uh, that, that's just wrong because we, we're all... We're, we're, that's the answer. Yeah, he's wrong. Yeah. He's wrong. Yeah. And, Should and, I be your friend? Yeah, and I'll be... <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. And I'll be, we, we can set up a private meeting and talk to him. But congratulations on you being a vegan and a vegetarian. And and that, I think that's a good thing and you should be proud of that. And uh, it, there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of. That's good stuff and good for you. So. But I, 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 there goes in the balance. I mean, there's a balance, exactly. You don't have a steak that hangs over the plate. You have a small little steak like Asian culture does that favor it. And it's true. I mean, to eat meat, the amount of meat that this country eats, that people eat, is terrible. Because what do you need? You need six pounds of... of, of uh, forage or, or hay to, to get one pound of meat. I mean, it's terrible. The corn, the corn that we raise now to make ethanol, that could feed so many more people instead of the animal that we then eat. I mean, it, it makes no sense. We have just get a balance. We have to reduce ourselves. Also, I think, I really truly believe we are all hunters or we are grazers. And there are people that are in their genes, they are hunters, and they need protein protein in the sense of animal protein. And I think, but I really think if it's a balance and it's a small piece, I think it's fine. But not if you have it every day or three times a day. So, and I think the people who are gatherers, for them it's very easy to say I'm vegan, I'm vegetarian, because they really don't crave the, the animal protein. So I think balance. 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 Okay, is key, we have five minutes, six minutes, and I want to see if I can get through two questions. So, quick three, question. Three, there are three. Be nice. Are there? I can't. I Come can't see. Again. Well, <laughs> then it's real quick answer. Okay, I quick question, quick brief. answer. Um, I'm a sophomore. My name is Emmy, and I was wondering, it's a less serious topic than sustainability. If you all had any advice for foodie students who want to pursue something in the food industry or have strong passions for food, but can't right now dual enroll in a culinary school or institution. Sure. I mean, you know, my suggestion is, is as uh, as chefs, we're, we're always our doors are always open for anyone that wants to spend a day in a kitchen or, or, or come hang out. It doesn't mean you have to be going to culinary school or have any talent. I mean, you know, it can be just being in the environment, keeping your eyes open, and seeing what we do. I mean, it's volunteer true. I mean, the farmers market's a good yeah. place too. Yeah. Volunteering at the farmers market's a good start. Too. What are you What are you studying now? Um, journalism. So I'm hoping to go. To Another one? Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> Food writing. So, <laughs> No, no, you know, you need to learn. You want to be in the business as a chef, as a restaurateur? Um, or you want to be in the food business, making sure that you can somehow change the way the world understands food? Much so, more of the chef business, but I can't tell my dad that. So I'm so, just using the journalism. Right. Oh, so maybe man. like dual roles. All right, we need to have separate career counseling, but volunteer <laughs> in kitchens for the day <laughs> and, and call food writers if you want to be a journalist and we, find we'll out how to her, be no? a food writer. What? Absolutely. Yeah. I have not two high school students that are come to me. I have every year people that come. You have just yeah. to find the restaurant where you like the food. And you go and you just ask them, mm -hmm. ask your stars, yeah, or your, your trailing or whatever you want to call it. Which means that you won't get paid and you have to work very hard. Yes. Right. Thank you. But you'll eat well. But yeah. <laughs> okay, two more yeah. questions. Hi, my name is Nick. Um, Jose and Spike talked a lot about going into schools, talking with students, and also with parents. And I think that that's really great. But do you also go to food service providers, who are the ones that are really serving the food, who are really bringing the ingredients in? Who are the ones that are serving the shitty food that these kids are eating? I, I no. mean, it's, it's, go ahead. No, you go. Yeah. All right, you go. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's a uh, it's a slow process. Do you know? You know what I mean? It's it's you, we got to get in the schools. We got to see what's happening. Uh, you know, you can't walk into a school and, and just throw out the caterer or the purveyor and, and just like you know, we have to figure out how this thing's going to work best. So the, the first 
you know, the first initiative was getting in and seeing what's happening and, and, and becoming a common face in the school uh, and earning the respect to even be able to start to make changes. Um, you know, if you go in and you're like, you know, I'm the most amazing chef. I'm gonna, you know, you know, revolutionize the way you guys eat. It's never gonna work. So, I mean, I think we're we're heading to that way. And I, I know I personally have already talked to some different caterers and some purveyors on how they can be assets to the initiative. Um, but like, yeah, it, it it's a slow process. But we need to go uh, higher, way higher USC, than yeah, the yeah, purveyors. USC. I mean. Todd is working, is doing an amazing job in, in, in his, uh, in, mm -hmm. what's the name of the school? Your ben Merch. Elementary. Ben Merch, really working hard on it. I mean, we need to understand something. Here what we are talking is about the school lunch program. If you are not aware, this has happened a few months ago, that very much kind of a bill was passed. But the, a bill that was unbelievably important because we are talking about feeding the children of America. But somehow no one even find out. You're asking this question because probably you live here. That's where the press should come in. Yeah. They I, did a yeah. good job. Excuse me. <laughs> but I covered that. Unfortunately, it <laughs> was not sexy. The issue was not sexy enough. So what it happens was if we don't have the money to feed those poor children where their parents cannot feed them, again, I told you, is no one that can do magic with nothing. So to a degree, the food we are feeding them it's in part an issue of the way we are running, in this case, our country, where we are able to put certain money in certain issues that I don't think they are as important as feeding children. In the year 2018, the obesity health cost is going to be around $600, $700 billion. And those are general numbers. It depends who you read, will be one number, will be another number. 218, six to seven hundred billion dollars issues related to obesity. Imagine if we start investing right now, one, two, three, four extra billion dollars to feed the children of America. The savings, five, ten years from now, will be so amazing that actually it's not like Congress or Senate is throwing money at feeding the children. It's actually they are investing in having an America that is healthier. But for some reason, we have no true senator or no true congressman that is willing to speak up on those issues. We had Senator Gillibrand that was very outspoken. We had uh, Jim Arkin. McGovern, Congressman Jim McGovern was very outspoken, and many other names. But we didn't have any of the big forces really pushing for it. We had the White House that somehow spoke in favor of it. Actually, it was OK. We got a bill. We got some money. But the issue, long story short, if we don't get the big dollars, which is not huge, it's few more cents per children per day. If we don't get that extra money, the issue of feeding children right is never gonna go away. We're gonna give children the vote and then they will have enough money, the kids you will vote it. for the money for the school lunch bill. Really quick question, really quick answer. No, no, I want quickly to say something because the question, the question you ask is how, what can you do for the big food? I think that's what the question about the food service companies. Like if you are here, for instance, I don't know who is the big company. Is it Marriott or Sodexo? Sodexo. 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 What you can do, you can put pressure on your president and tell him that he puts pressure on Sodexo that they have to come up with healthier uh, items. I think that's how it's done. I know that that's how it's done in Georgetown. He's going to regret having had this panel for <laughs> um, OK, last question. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm a member of GW Students for Fair Trade. And I guess my question was, when you guys buy different products at your restaurant, what kind of when do you have to make that hard decision? Like, when are you buying not fair trade chocolate or fair trade chocolate? Or when you're buying different percentages of corn or grass-fed meat? Like, when does that, like, what gets put by the wayside? Like, what do you put more importance? What do you put importance on at your restaurants? My, we wouldn't buy anything if we would <laughs> start looking at every issue. And now I mean it seriously. I think it's uh, 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 very, very important question in the issue that we have many organizations that sometimes they make us aware of certain issues, coffee or chocolate, but also the Nikes we wear or the iPhone that the other day I learned that I don't know how many people are uh, killing themselves in a plan I don't know where in Asia. So obviously all those issues are, are, are important to know. Are, are, uh, but sometimes we cannot be as a chef be aware of every single thing goes behind every single ingredient. And sometimes the press is the one that, hey, look at what's happening with these tomatoes that are coming from Mexico. 
uh, look at how the farmer, or oh, forget Mexico in the States. Uh, Immokalee, Florida. Yeah. We know that we have many places that we have farmers that we, I'm able to buy an affordable and cheap tomato because we are paying those farmers close to nothing. And to, on top of that, they were illegal, but someone let them pass because it's been, so wow, it's issues like behind almost every, every, but, every, but every ingredient. But just to close this question, I mean, do you, do you ever, do you have fair trade? Would you put fair trade on your menu and would your customers sort of recognize that or ask for it? It's not kind of on the, in the, I mean, on the radar screen for. I that just builds another layer of complication, to yeah, be honest I mean, with I you. I mean, we're cooks, we're not politicians. I mean, we're sitting here tonight probably playing more of a, more of a, that role than Cook's role. But um, I think that at the end of the day, we write our menus and we write what we feel is natural and what's close to our heart and what we think our customers want. And we try to make a couple dollars at the end of the day. Well, you yeah. couldn't have closed this panel that, that's, for me that's not, better. That's not, the, uh, that's not how I think. I think that was um, There are some that think heavier than others. <laughs> No, but I'm probably not a definition of a chef as they are. For me, the restaurant was not so much about if I can stack my food or do chemical cuisine or whatever. For me, it was always the chemical message. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> the molecular cuisine. Bread making is chemical. Right. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was always the message. And, and I, I think everybody has their own thing. So I, I, for me, the message was that I want to put healthy food on the table to share with people, to teach them that you can eat healthy food. It doesn't have to be bean sprouts and rice and macrame hanging and you know whatever. It can be in a wonderful setting and elegant. You can have your good glass of wine with it. It doesn't mean a special diet. It means something that you have to believe in. You can do it yourself. And I think that was my, the message. And that's why I say for me, it's automatic that whatever I have in the restaurant, if it's certified organic, it's also automatically fair trade. If it's imported from countries where fair trade is important. Yep. Okay. So that's what I want Thank to do. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think. She did an amazing job, right? Mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I just want to close out with just a quick comment. I mean, I think that the, you know, the issue, we, we've covered a lot of ground tonight, but I think that, you know, the theme that comes up for me in this whole discussion, no matter who it is, is just about how sustainability requires a little bit of behavior change. I mean, you can't just have it be sustainable and have it be the way it always was. The same price, the same availability, the same season, you know, the same amount of work. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things that's often missing in this discussion is, you know, how, are it, how is it going to require you to change? And is that a compromise that you're willing to make? And, um, you know, I think for us all to move forward, it just requires everybody to think about what they can do within the context. It's not that there's one right thing to do. It's that, what can you do the way you live your life, you know, whether you're a chef or a student or a parent or a school cafeteria chef. So um, I just want to thank our panel for being here. Um, I want to remind everybody that there's a reception afterwards upstairs and to please join us. And um, thank you very much for hosting us. And uh, thank you very much.